Vincent, good afternoon. David, it's a pleasure. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing good, particularly yeah. since it's a holiday in Thailand. <laughs> it seems like only yesterday we were at the British club together. So long to go now. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> the, world, the world has changed so much since then. That's right. The simple pleasures yeah, overnight of... Overnight uh, change. Yeah. Who would so have guessed? How, how is everything going for you? How is your business adapting to this? Oh, actually, before we, before we get into that, um, I should probably introduce who, who I'm speaking to. This is primarily going to be for LinkedIn, and you're a big character around town, so I'm sure everybody knows you. Um, but why don't I you give us a quick <laughs> introduction to, to who you are and what it is you do? Well, Vincent Aloysius, uh, been in Bangkok for five years now. I'm with the Sign City Cement uh, group of companies. I hit a uh, subsidiary called NC EcoCycle. Yes, and we can talk a bit company. more yes. about the business. Latest. Yes, yeah. we'll get into that. It's a very interesting business and it's the perfect timing for exactly what you do. So uh, before we get into all of, of, all of that stuff, like how is, I think every business has adapted differently to the COVID situation, some better than others. Um, how has it gone for you? How is your team working out? How is the remote work going for you? Okay, I think we, we, we started with, you know, first of all, this is like, a movie, you know, uh, nobody expected something to happen so rapidly and, and, and at such a scale. Yeah? Uh, but, you know, what really helped us to organize ourselves and not lose our heads was the fact that we had a um, business continuity plan in place. Not perfect and nothing really prepared us for uh, a COVID-19 situation, but nevertheless, we had a business continuity plan. <laughs> mm. That sort of helped us to you know, organize ourselves and put our heads together and think about what needs to happen and how rapidly we needed to mobilize people to work from alternative sites, uh, working from home and all that, you know. Mm. I think that's that's really fortunate for you because we're, we're a relatively small company and for us, when it happened, I don't think I took it seriously enough until it was not quite too late, but it was getting there. And I was like, oh no, we have to, we're going to have to go remote here. So it was a steep learning curve for the first week or two. So I think, you know, I think for a lot of companies uh, in Thailand, particularly who've gone through, who's gone through companies that have gone through big difficulties, huh? like, you know, we had, we had the major floods, and then financial crisis, you know, in the past, that sort of prepared them to have, you know, in place a, a, a business continuity plan. Now, it's not something that you would look at every day and freshen up, you know, every month. But still, you know, the, the fact that it's there, you know, you could, you know, you already have your mind around something like mm. this. You know? Well, I think that, I have a lot more um, understanding for my bosses at those times because I was here for two coups and the flood and all the other fun things we've had over the last 15 years. But I was always an employee, so it was always quite easy. I just got to stay home and take it easy. But yeah, there's a lot of um, extra gray hairs have come from this uh, <laughs> from this last month. It's, it's tough to be the boss. Well, well, you, you're like a parent, you know. You, you, you're responsible for so many people. <laughs> that's it. That's it. When, when they grow up, they'll, they'll appreciate it, I'm sure. <laughs> A few years from now. <laughs> so from the things that you're doing in your business in this period, is there anything that you think is going to carry over to the post-COVID period? Any of the lessons you've learned from this or any of the formats you've been using to do your work? Do you think anything's going to carry over into the next year and, and beyond? Yeah, there's, there's a few things. You know, I mean, particularly for the business that we are in and, uh, for EcoCycle's business, we are, we are about sustainability. So this is something that, you know, we've been talking about, you know, a kind of future that we want to see, right? I mean, cleaner air, cleaner water, less CO2. This is something that's always been in our DNA. But I can imagine for businesses, regular businesses, you know, um, they would be thinking about, you know, COVID-19 as another massive uh, 
destabilizer or, or you know something that's you know hit you and then you really need to do something major to uh, to keep on going for the longevity of the of of the business or perhaps even you know if you if you don't embrace this disruption and make and be able to to change in a rapid way you know you're not going to be around for very long or your business is going to be shrinking substantially yeah so i, I think that's, that's the kind of thought yeah i think it's interesting spin on um, sustainability i think a lot of people when they hear the word they think of purely kind of eco sustainability purely kind of green sustainability but i think what you alluded to there is that sustainability takes many forms it's it's those it's planning for a crisis. It's building the right culture. It's building the right working environment. And yeah. I think that... You know, a lot of people uh, talk about sustainability and, and they do it very interchangeably with, with ESG, environment, social and governance. You know, mm. those sort of things should be already there. But I think we've got to also bring in the element of um, a purpose-driven company. You know, if... if if you you have an if you're an organization that you know has a certain purpose then i think and and if you stuck to that um even with a huge disruption like this you would you would still know what sort of direction to go and what are the things that you are able to let go or do more of you know in 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 an opportunity like this you know i i know it sounds very cliche right but it it's it does put you in a situation where you really need to think hard about survival, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, there's no escape. We, we have to, you know, rethink the business. So I, um, I think you're talking about the big idea there, right? So the, we all have the what of what we do. We produce things, we sell things, but it's the why, like what is the underlying purpose? What is our mission? What is our passion? Um, I think that's a really interesting and key point. It's one of the, I spoke to Stuart Kelly at the, the first one of these, and he was talking about the same kind of thing, that this is an opportunity for businesses to either kind of remember why they got started in the first yeah. place or to kind of now to think about it. Because as you said, it may not be a time of um, abundance coming up next. So we, we, we need to think about what it is that is at our core and that we can truly fight for. Um, in order for us to regrow and to, to build better businesses and better economies that are focused on giving good experiences to the employees. I think yeah. one of the, one of the musings that I've had on all of this is that there's a lot of talk about the end of the office with, with COVID and that um, there's going to be a huge revolution and the working world of 2021 is you know, everyone's at home. It's futuristic. It's different. I don't subscribe to that. I don't think it's going to be a, complete revolution i think there'll be an evolution i think that what we as companies are going to be competing against isn't necessarily other companies but it's going to be spaces um if your employee can do his job or her job better at home as a business leader let's let them be home then um but at the same time if you're going to have them coming in the office it needs to be a comfortable space that is set up so that it's better than the home. It's more relaxing. It's more conducive to meetings. It's, it's easier to focus. Um, I'm talking a lot here, sorry, but um, yeah. what, what is your thought on those kind of conversations? Do you think there's going to be a, are we going to be coming into a whole new world of business or is it going to be the same? I think, changes? you know, I, I, I tend to agree with your evolution scenario. Um, partly also because, you know, human beings, we've got very short memories. You know, as soon as this is over, people will very quickly go back to the old ways. You know, uh, but I think we have we have an opportunity here to just pause and and see what what could be better. You know, there are you know I was I I need to maybe talk about a little bit about what a conversation I was having with my kid. You know, and uh, he had. He's got an assignment that, you know, he's, he's got to put out. And it's about silver linings coming out of COVID-19. And we were thinking about various things. And we were thinking about, you know, two things that and I'm going to steal from him. His idea was, he said, look, 
you know, there's going to be people collaboration. I said, great. To do what? You know, a quicker search for a cure for a, vac a, a vaccine or a cure for perhaps some other disease, cancer, who knows? And the situation like this has put us to, you know, think more about co-creation and collaboration, which should be happening in business a lot more, right? And, and then he talked about healing earth. And those two things, you know, really uh, resonated with me because, you know, we are always thinking sustainability in that pure sense, right? And you, if you just looked around you, uh, the, the, from what you read, uh, the air is cleaner, uh, you know, sea life has been appearing much closer to, to shore. Uh, and, you know, a lot of CO2 comes from transportation. Mm -hmm. And there's another data that, that, that looks so good, and it's about accidents and death on the road. And it has halved, you know, perhaps globally. And you think, you know, how much of that, you know, accidents that's happening is from useless or not so productive travel, mm. including people going to work, you know, so, <laughs> uh, to the office of it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably the irony that there's probably more people alive because of COVID. Um, think Songkran, for example, what those 500 people a year didn't die this year. Um, the yeah. pollution in China is way down. So people are not getting such bad lung problems. So yeah, yeah maybe the problem is us. <laughs> and our, but and you know, ways. some businesses are, you know, kind of like, you know, if you're ready for it and you're poised to, 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 to grab it, right? You know, in FinTech platforms, in, I don't know, food delivery services, in, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals and people like that. I mean, and even companies that can very quickly switch over to produce face masks, they are actually making a ton of money during this period, you know, yeah. because there's a need for it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that's capitalism in action, I guess. Um, I, I like, I thank you for crediting your son there, by the way. It was good of you not to take his ideas for your own. Um, <laughs> He'll appreciate that. I'm Little sure. Zachary, nine years old. <laughs> Thank you, Zachary. Thank you. Um, but yeah, great, great thoughts there. I think that partly the it's been an easy decade, I guess, um, since the the big crash for people in in the Western world or people who are kind of doing okay. It's, there's not been that many hardships. Um, yeah. So we've kind of been a bit decadent, I think, especially in the West. The people we've elected, the way we behaved, it's it's not it's like living for today. Everything's great. You know, nothing's ever going to go wrong. I think that we're going to have a reality check now because if we do end up in you know, another crisis, the leadership that we need, you know, it needs to know, be different than this. There's, there's another reality check. And this is something not related to the industry I'm in. It's the fashion business, the consumption of extremely cheap garments, you know, mm. uh, and, and, you know, we have seen that, you know, during the COVID period, people are actually saying, look, stop buying new clothes, you know, <laughs> free up the system to, to actually deliver much needed, you know, urgent things, you know, but then you look at it, right? Um, what's going to happen in the future? You know, what would be new norms, you know? Um, you see in the news, uh, a lot of conversations uh, around foreign workers and the conditions that they're living in, very close proximity. Uh, now that suddenly there's a pandemic, you know, it's like, you know, these poor souls are responsible somehow, you know. They, they didn't get into that situation because, you know, they wanted to. They get into that situation because we want to have extremely cheap clothing or extremely cheap labor for building our infrastructure. And uh, so these are things that are going to be part of our ESG. You know, we need to look at this. You know, it's, mm. an, it's ESG and business continuity plan as well. If you don't have, you know, decent housing, uh, decent wages for um, migrant workers, then 
you know, be prepared to deal with this kind of situation when there's Absolutely. an outbreak. Absolutely. Know? And healthcare too. People need to have access to healthcare. Um, right. It's a universal uh, it's a right. We all, if someone gets sick in society, we all get sick unless they get help. So yeah. hopefully kindness and goodness and, and more sensible minds emerge out of this. I guess it's giving everyone time to think as well. It's, we all operate at 100 miles an hour. So the leaders as well as the people, we're all, I think it's, a, it's like the earth has put us on timeout <laughs> for a couple of months to think about what we've done. So yeah. um, on that topic, um, I think that the work you're doing is, is really great. And once things get back to normal, I think the kind of ideas you're leading and the why of your company I think it's going to have a much bigger stage moving forward. So I know we alluded to it at the start, but yeah. what is it you do exactly? What does your company do? Well, you know, EcoCycle, we have, we have two core businesses that we, we focus on. One is about waste management, and that's providing a service that's removing waste that's ending up in landfills. We are turning that into a fuel, an alternative fuel that, you know, it, you, you can call it um, energy recycling. So we're picking up, we're harnessing the energy that's in waste, right? So that's one. The other part of the business is an industrial services business. And it's a very specialist cleaning business. You know, we do a lot of uh, decontamination. People work in very, um, our guys are very highly skilled, trained people. And they're normally fully geared up in their PPEs, working in a confined space with gases, with toxic elements uh, in that sort of environment. And actually, you know, um, since this COVID uh, uh, situation happened, we have act, we kind of like put together a team to come up with a new service. And that's really a service of uh, providing this disinfection so we go into offices, schools, um, you know, commercial buildings and, and do a disinfection service that can happen, say, once in two weeks, for example. And these are things that are going to become the new norm yeah, in, mm -hmm. in businesses, in factories where you've got hundreds of people, thousands of people coming in and out, you know, and this sort of activity can actually even help, you know, not just you know, dealing with something like serious like COVID, you know, but something more common uh, through the, you know, hygiene and sanitization process, you know, keeping that good, we might even be able to help folks in the workplace stay healthier so that they don't have too much downtime, you know. So that's, that's the kind of, you know, new norms that I'm thinking about. So that's one aspect. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about, about the waste management side. You know, we, we are doing a lot about dealing with plastics, particularly, you know, before COVID, the, the, the hot news was marine plastic pollution. And we do something about that because uh, plastics that cannot be recycled back to plastics, uh, these are single-use plastics that are, you know, uh, maybe has got a combination of various plastics in it. Uh, they, would, they could be used in, in the uh, energy recycling kind of business. Now, unfortunately, during COVID, we've had to use more plastics. Consumption of plastics actually has gone up. That's because it's convenient and it's hygienic to you know, transfer pack to things like that, right? So, I mean, uh, a lot of people very quickly point the finger as, as at plastic being the, you know, the evil itself. But, you know, really, we look, we, take, we look at it in a different way. The devil is not plastic or plastic and all sorts of plastics. The devil is the fact that we don't have proper infrastructure to deal with this, particularly a collection infrastructure for non-recyclables. So that's something that we, we think perhaps after post COVID, you know, when, when people can breathe a little bit easier, we can say, focus on this. In fact, I, I, I would say that we are, we are collaborating with some big brands, big FMCG brands to actually come up with some pilot projects that's gonna support the 
you know, efforts of the Alliance to End Plastic Waste to come up with some uh, solutions that can uh, take care of this marine plastic pollution. It's really a leakage of plastic, right? Mm. Uh, to see if that can be scaled up. So we're very, very proud to be part of that process. Excellent, excellent. For the, for the first part of the business, when you turn the waste into energy, um, who, who is that aimed at? Which kind of companies would benefit from that? So, um, from, you know, it's such a wide, wide uh, range of industries that we serve, you know, from, from automotive sector, which is quite big in Thailand, uh, to FMCG products, anything to do with packaging. Um, so, and oil and gas, you know, a, a huge range uh, of product. You, you, you'd be surprised if I told you the, the brands, you know, that, that we, we support. Um, so, uh, what we do is uh, we, you know, we are offering them a solution to help reduce their own footprint. Mm. Um, because what would be the other options? The other options would be landfilling, which, you know, most of these companies do not like because they've got their own policies about improving their environmental performance. Then you might have a solution, which is an uh, incineration solution. But incinerating waste also means, you know, you've got to use up a lot of valuable fossil fuels mm. and you still end up with some residues that uh, need to go uh, to a landfill somehow, ashes, things like that. Mm. So with what we do is we, we are, we are we're shredding, we're blending, we're turning the waste into um, a tightly controlled, quality controlled product that can be fed into an energy intensive business. For example, a cement kiln, you know, that operates at, you know, more than 2000 degrees Celsius. Mm. So, so if, if the governments of the world and the companies of the world could come to you instead, there'd be no landfills. We could get rid of all of that mess, we could have a better Bangkok, better Thailand? Well, you know, uh, it's, I, I would say, the, I mean, this is not new in the cement industry across the globe, right? Mm. Um, and there's two things, you know, need to happen. One is business-led, businesses need to want to do the right thing. Mm. And the other part of it would be the regulatory, regulatory environment to, to to take a stand that, you know, look, we don't want to have landfills. Uh, we want to use as much as possible the resources that we dig up from, from our planet and not throw that away. So waste plastics, if it cannot be recycled back to plastics, at least turn it into a fuel which we can use to replace fossil fuels, right? Mm. So try to use as much as possible resources that we take from our planet. I think there's a, there's a solid business logic too. I think one of the, the problems with capitalism is externalities. Um, if you're a business owner, the cheapest thing to do is just throw it out the window. You don't need it anymore. Yep. Because then it costs you zero. It's out of your way. It's not your problem anymore. Obviously, that's bad for society. That's bad for all of us. But as a, from a business perspective, it's logical. I think one of the things we discussed already is that the, there's an emergent trend towards sustainability as a concept. And especially with the, the younger generation coming up, they're looking to join firms that have a why. As you said, there's a mission behind it. They do good things, they help society, they take care of their staff and it's sustainability 360. It's helping the earth, it's helping the community, it's helping the employees and it's helping the company. They all grow together. So you mentioned earlier the why of companies. What is the why of what you do? What is the underlying drive that gets you out of bed in the morning? Well, for me, it's easier. I mean, but generally speaking, I think, you know, most business, businesses out there, they want to do something, a service or a product that, that they, can, they, they can provide to the market that delivers some good, right? So, but in my case, I think just the fact that, you know, you're doing something for the planet, that's, that's a big motivator to, um, to get out of bed, you know, which can be quite hard for some people. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, yes. Uh, I, and, and, and also, I, I, it feels pretty cool when I talk to my kid to say, you know, 
I'm going to do something for Earth today. So <laughs> awesome. I can brag about it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So are you mostly working at home at the moment? Well, you know, I like to say yes, but no. I'm, I'm getting in there um, because, you know, there are some things that, you know, I, I, I need to be on site for. Uh, but it seems to be working quite smoothly without any glitches. You know, we've got about, you know, 50 to 60% of our folks working from home. The rest of them are actually, you know, I call our frontliners. You know, we are talking about frontliners in the, in the medical and health services. You know, heads off to them. But also these guys from, from my team who have actually need to get to a client's site and, and do, get the job done physically. Uh, for EcoCycle, these guys, you know, and girls are our, our frontline guys, you know, so... Heads off to them, and you know we're constantly reminding them about keeping themselves safe first, and then you know keeping the rest of us able to conduct our business without any disruptions. And so it's it's really important. Yeah, yeah, I, I, we're in the same situation. I'm I'm at the office most days, but a lot of most of the team still still remote until we have right. a good understanding of what's going to happen. Um, for me, it was a I didn't really enjoy the work from home aspect of it. I, my house isn't really, I'm not in the right mental space at home. Like I, whatever, uh -huh. when, I'm on the, when I'm on the sofa, my instincts are saying, go and get the popcorn, put on a movie. It's, it's, <laughs> not, <laughs> it's not business really? planning and, and big ideas. So That's how it should be. <laughs> <laughs> so the office is better for me. Um, while you were working at home, um, what were the essential things that you found that you needed? Whether they be serious things like a calendar or more silly things like a gin and tonic at 6 p.m.? Like, what were the things that you found that you needed to do when you were home? Working from home? Yeah. Uh, I, I think like you, uh, perhaps the, uh, the, 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 the discipline part, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. you know it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. But we also forget sometimes that, you know, we are available all the time and you want to reach out to somebody else who might be on another call or on-site work and you know so i think you know we need to work around people's availabilities and times as well you know uh, but apart from that not really i'm able to get in a little bit more exercise than i would normally do <laughs> so <Right. laughs> it, it it works fine it works fine yeah i think my my liver is thankful for there's less events because usually I'm at an event every day. So I think my body's grateful for this little break <laughs> in the routine. In the routine. So um, before, we, before we wrap it up, so last week I spoke to uh, William Malik, who I think you also, you also know. He has a lot of futuristic ideas. Like he wrote a white paper last year that was called the, uh, the Future of Work, How to Manage an Empty Office, which I read in November or December, and it was very abstract at the time. Now it's, it's here. You know, what he saw coming actually became. Uh, and he's talking about how basically, yeah, the, we spoke about this earlier on, but how our office life is going to be all changed. Things are going to be different. What that's taught me uh, from reading his work and from seeing it in action is, is about digital transformation. I think it was a phrase everyone has been using for the last couple of years. Um, but I think I now understand it better. And it's not that complicated. It's, it's just a case of making sure that everything is digitized. You understand the numbers, um, how long things take, what the process is, what the process map looks like. Having that information allows for business models to be changed by digital transformation. And that may include work from home. It may be new service lines. It may be dropping some things, as you said, and bringing up other things. But it's really just about making sure you have the data to drive your decision-making. Um, There's not really a question to go with that, but um, have you had any of those I, kind of... Um, I, I have a, a, a great respect and admiration for William Malik. Eh? It's, it's, a, it's a great guy to listen to, very original thoughts. You know, I... I Perhaps I have much more basic uh, thoughts around 
digitizations and you know how it's working quite well for us uh, now um, you know working from home and all that right but you know if we didn't have um, stable energy available if we had disruptions to power this is not going to work so that's another area that we need to really look at um, you know the future of energy uh, is something that you know I I I follow and and I think we need to really do something about you know speeding up even more um, renewable energy because you know traditional energy fossil fuels the oil prices that are crazy at the moment you know the only um, excuse that you know we hear very often is, is about you know uh, stability and, and uh, of uh, traditional fuels while you know uh, non-renewables are having issues with you know uh, stability and availability and, and storage and things like that but you know this all these can be overcome and uh, and there's a as a brighter future for us if we and a much more secure future as well if we want digitization digitization to work energy security needs to be happening as well and that's really going to clean up our planet even more so I, I'm, I'm all for that <laughs> from that angle Vincent obviously you're an expert in in this area of renewables and, and clean energy um, what do you think is the major um, impediment to greater developments in those areas? Why is it that America is not all full of windmills at this point and the UK is not, well, maybe not solar in the UK, but um, other alternative energy sources? What is this, why is it taking so long for this to, to be picked up by these governments? Well, because it, it works for some folks, right? Status quo, the status quo works for some folks and some companies, but I think they also are starting to realize that, you know, at some point it's going to get much more difficult and expensive to extract energy out of the earth's core mm. and uh, it's going to be harder and harder to um, to justify uh, keeping fossil fuel prices you know at an extremely low level so uh, one is the economics and the other aspect of it is you know regulatory as well so if we can get around the co2 tax issues and we can get around the, the, you know, making it technically cheaper to, to have stable supply and a more expansive uh, supply of uh, renewables, then things will get traction and who knows, you know, the, you know, I can see a transition of the oil and gas players going into renewables now. That's, that's, that's already a light at the end of the tunnel. I was going to say something similar. I, I didn't know about that, but the example I was thinking of is Philip Morris. So Philip Morris, do you know what their, their tagline is right now? Do you know what their motto is? Tell me. Um, Towards a smoke-free future. Okay. Which, when I heard that, I was very counterintuitive. Like a smoke-free future is a future without Philip Morris. Like how, is that, how is that their goal? But I think what they're looking to do is to there's obviously been over many years, a huge public backlash against tobacco, against smoking. Yes. Um, so I think they've recognized that people are still going to want to consume nicotine. They're still going to want to do that. So I think they're going to be investing a lot in R and D around um, vaping and things like this. So yeah. um, maybe not a smoke free future, but a, a vape uh, filled future could be. So it, 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 may well be that, it may be that these uh, these other companies, as you mentioned, that the public pressure builds so much that there's money to be made in these other spaces too. They've got the infrastructure, they've got the investments. If they move first, they'll dominate it. So, um, you, you know, David, I I found a perfect uh, uh, thing to to talk about uh, to wrap up our conversation. Okay, and you know. Billions and billions have been made, you know, destroying the planet. Now it's time for billions to be made fixing it up. Wonderful. So there is money in it and we can do a good thing. 
<laughs> There's a quote image if ever I saw one. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, Vincent, on that note, I think that's a perfect ending. Thank you for your time today, as always. Um, I'm looking Pleasure, forward to, man. to seeing you face to face when uh, when things calm down a bit. Um, Fantastic. Stay well. Final point, if anybody wants to get hold of you, um, what's the best way to contact you or contact the company? Um, LinkedIn, EcoCycle is there, INC EcoCycle is there. And uh, yeah, that, that would be the easiest way, I think. Okay, I'll link to it in the post when it goes live. Thank you so much, Vincent. Cheers.